Hello everybody. Um, today I want to talk about another fairly complicated topic, uh, changelings. I'm pretty sure at this point that someone could write an entire dissertation on this subject. Um, knowing academia, somebody probably has written an entire dissertation on this subject. So it's going to be a little tricky trying to fit this into a 20 minute video. I'm going to do my best. Uh, I'm going to have to go through things fairly quickly. I will put a link in the comments to something I've previously written about changelings, um, just because it is a lot to go over. And I don't want to get too bogged down trying to give um, specific details and, and anecdotes, or this is going to end up being an hour-long video. And I'm trying to avoid that. <laughs> trying. We'll see how it goes. So, changelings. And now I am not talking about the role-playing game talking about the folkloric changelings here. What are changelings? Well, the answer in folklore is reasonably straightforward, that um, traditionally and historically, uh, changelings are one of two things. They can either be a um, fairy who comes in and replaces a living human being. And when that occurs, they're usually described as being um, the size of an infant, uh, in most cases, um, old, wizened, unpleasant, um, ancient, uh, kind of along those lines. Uh, not what we would imagine, perhaps, uh, a fairy being in the sense of um, beautiful, wise, skilled, uh, none of that. Um, don't imagine that. If you can imagine sort of like the the classical artwork depictions of like a gnome or a dwarf, um, not the Lord of the Rings type, that sort of being. Um, tiny, grumpy, demanding, um, but very, very old and knowledgeable, um, which will come in hand important later. So keep that in mind. That's one type of changeling that we see. Um, the other type of changeling that we see is not a living being at all. Um, it's actually an inanimate object that has been glamoured, um, that has been enchanted using fairy magic to appear to be the human that has been replaced. And often when we see this appearing in anecdotal material, um, it's a piece of wood. A piece of wood or a twig or a stick or something along those lines that has been made to look like the person. So when we're looking at classic um, sort of folklore changelings, this is what we're talking about. Um, it's either um, a, an older, I use the word older a bit in quotations because obviously we're talking about otherworldly beings. Age is a little bit of a fluid, ambiguous concept, um, but they're described as being uh, physically appearing older. Um, or uh, it is not a living item at all, it's an inanimate object. And that, simply put, is what a changeling is. Um, and then fairies, by means of their magic, their glamour, make either this other fairy or this inanimate object look like a specific living human. Um, often in the case of changelings, an infant, that's sort of the most well-known example, but not always. Um, we do have stories, um, folklore and anecdotes relating to adult changelings, adults who are taken as adults and replaced with changelings. Um, so that does happen. Um, in those cases, it's usually women who have just given birth or new brides that are taken. Although I can think of at least one example, um, I believe from Yates, um, although it might have been Lady Wilde, of um, a young man who was taken uh, and a changeling was left. So when we're talking about what is a changeling, that is what they are. Fairies use their magic. Uh, they take a human, they replace the human with one of their own. Um, why do fairies take humans? Uh, 
That is a much more complicated and layered question, but it is sort of intrinsic to the whole topic of changelings. Um, in some cases, uh, we can tell from the stories that they take them in order to change that person into a fairy, which is definitely the topic of another video, although I did touch on it in the one about um, fairies and the human dead. Um, in other cases, particularly when it's a mother who has just given birth um, or a woman who has a, a young infant at home, uh, they will sometimes take uh, a woman in order for her to be a nursemaid um, to nurse a fairy infant. Um, they will also take humans as breeding stock. I know people hate hearing that because we do have this super romanticized view now of, of fairies. And I think um, this is a case where urban fantasy and uh, modern novels have not done us any favors because we have this kind of newly embedded idea um, in modern American culture that uh, there's this sort of romantic thing that goes on with humans and fairies. I'm not saying that never happens, the whole video on fairies and humans and sex after all, but even in that video, I did mention that often does not end well for the human. And when those sorts of things happen, uh, you know, arguably, when we look at the anecdotal material and the folklore, there are usually ulterior motives on the fairy end of things. Um, we don't always understand what they are, but um, at least in some cases, it appears to be um, entirely for the purpose of procreation. There is a wide, wide swath of material um, going back quite a ways uh, that discusses the fairies' need to um, increase or strengthen their numbers. Uh, nobody knows exactly why. Um, there's a lot of theories. Um, I don't want to get totally sidetracked into that, but... Uh, it seems fairly safe to say that um, the good people do not reproduce easily or often um, based on their need for nursemaids and human midwives. I think we can safely conclude that um, that is an area that they, they need our assistance with. Um, they do have infants and children of their own. Again, folklore and anecdotal material makes that clear. Um, there's a story in uh, the Duchess IE uh, database, um, that collection of uh, anecdotal stories and folklore collected by uh, children in Ireland in the early 20th century, where a man talks about being invited into a fairy fort to witness at a fairy baptism. It's a fascinating story. Um, but that does illustrate that they do have their own children. They do have children of their own. They're not entirely dependent upon stealing human beings for this purpose, but they certainly do um, steal humans for that purpose in some cases. Um, they also do steal uh, human women at least uh, for the purpose of producing children. And there's no indication that that is necessarily a super romantic situation for the human involved. Um, there's also some hints in material uh, that they may also take young men uh, for a similar purpose, if you will. So um, breeding stock, definitely an option. Um, we also have a lot of uh, material and folklore that indicates they'll take humans to be servants. Um, again, contrary to what we see in modern stories, uh, modern fiction stories, I should clarify, uh, this is not some super romantic uh you get to be the, the right hand of, you know, fairy royalty and some sort of trusted friend and advisor, you know, think more scrubbing chamber pots and cleaning ashes out of fireplaces kind of thing. Um, so it's not necessarily a fate that you might want to uh, advocate for for yourself. Um, but that is certainly one thing that we see uh, fairies taking people for. So, um, you know, we have them taking people to change into fairies. We have them um, taking people as nursemaids. We have them taking people as breeding stock and as servants. And we also have them taking people for reasons that we just don't understand. 
Um, and these are all, by the way, people who are taken permanently. Um, as we discussed in the other video about ferry borrowing, they do occasionally borrow people that are returned. That's an entirely separate category. Um, these are people who are taken and replaced with changelings with the idea that um, the changelings would then sicken and die in our world and that all of the the human who was taken all of their friends and family would believe that they had died and mourn them and go on with their lives and not keep looking for them or seeking them and the way that we know that they were taken generally is that in the stories and the anecdotes and the folklore someone sees them later at some point um, sometimes a year later sometimes several years later um, they see the person um, apparently still alive uh, and the person will often communicate to the, the living friend or relative that they had never died. They had actually been taken um, and brought in amongst the fairies and now live there for whatever purpose. So, you know, that's that's sort of a whole different category from fairy borrowing. This is just outright stealing people. Um why did they do it? Really, ultimately, we don't know for sure. Um, is it uh, the the switching out with changelings part? Is it a temporary distraction so that they can successfully take the person without interference? Um, the changeling is left behind. Um, people don't realize it's a changeling. Uh, usually until they've had the person for a little while. Is it for amusement? Um, they leave the changeling so that uh, people are sort of left to deal with the changeling while they've taken the living human. We, we honestly don't know. Um, particularly when the changeling is a fairy, um, which seems to be most common when infants are taken. Um... We don't know for certain why. Sometimes it's a, a fairy changeling that's left behind, and sometimes it's an inanimate object left behind. Um, we just know that those are sort of the two approaches to changelings. Um, there are a variety of methods for uncovering if a um, person is a changeling, is not actually themselves anymore, and then recovering the original person. In some folklore and anecdotes, these methods work, and the original person is then recovered. Um, in other folklore and anecdotes, these things do not work, and usually the end result is murder, quite frankly. Um, the changeling lore has a lot of very dark uh, stories attached to it because of this. Um, there's been quite a few cases in the 19th century in particular uh, relating to infants and young children who ended up being fairly horrifically killed um, because of changeling lore. Uh, the belief was, um, of course, that you would have a perfectly normal child. Um, usually what would happen is you would leave them unguarded or unprotected for a brief amount of time, and then all of a sudden your child would um, not be your child anymore. They would have gone from uh, very sweet and mild-tempered and beautiful to suddenly screaming all the time and being very demanding and nothing you would do would make them happy. Um, just a complete personality change. And, um, you know, in the, the older lore, uh, when we look at going back, you know, prior to really the 19th century, uh, the idea was that you could prevent this from happening by making sure the child always had some iron um, on or near it, um, on or near them, that uh, it always had um, maybe a bit of salt around them. Uh, broom, the plant uh, broom, not a physical broom, um, a bit of fresh bread, uh, an open Bible. Um, in Christian belief, if they were baptized as soon as possible, that would 
protect them from being taken as a changeling. That sounds very simple to us now, but um, historically it actually used to be very difficult um, to get a child baptized because every community didn't necessarily have a priest in residence. Um, sometimes you had to wait until the priest kind of came through traveling or you'd have to go a distance um, to get to the priest, uh, depending on, you know, where we're talking about and where a person lived. Um, so getting a child baptized uh, sometimes took took a bit of a while. Either way, um, the idea was that there were certain things you could do to protect the child. If those things were not done, um, they could potentially become a changeling. There were also certain things that other people could do. You weren't supposed to compliment a child. Um, you weren't supposed to say that they were beautiful or sweet or anything like that because that would draw the attention of the good people and then they potentially might be taken. Um, there was actually a widespread tradition at one point of dressing um, infant boys and toddler boys as girls because it was believed that the fairies were more inclined to take boys um, at that age, uh, which is interesting because as adults, they're more inclined to take women, adult women. Um, either way, uh, so we see a lot of these sort of prophylactic uh, practices relating to infants and, and toddlers to protect them. Um, and the belief was if, if you could discover that your child had been taken, uh, you could get them back. The reason in the 19th century that we start to see all of these deaths associated with this belief system is because generally the method to get them back was to be so abusive to the changeling that the fairies would come to reclaim uh, the fairy. Uh, and obviously, if it's not a fairy, if it's a human child who has become ill or um, has a medical condition or has any other thing going on with it, uh, they're not going to survive several days of very um, pointed intentional physical abuse, which is what would happen. Um, I, I could get into listing it, but I, I'd really rather not because it's, it's, it is fairly horrific in, in many cases. Um, in the most mild cases, I guess I'll say they would just be neglected. They would be put outside um, and left to scream and cry with the theory that the fairies would then come and take the changeling back and then leave the original child. Um, in other cases, it was not that pleasant. Um, there's at least one case on record that I've read about where a child was drowned, um, if that tells you anything. And that, that was one of the more pleasant ones. Um, so it's just the, the treatment of these infants and children who were believed to be changelings was... Um, it was pretty ghastly. And, uh, obviously those were not changelings. Those were, were in fact human children. There's, uh, at least one example I know of where the child had been born, um, clearly with medical issues. Uh, they had always been paralyzed and unable to speak. And when they were about four, uh, some friends of the family had convinced the parents to attempt this sort of changeling cure to get the the human child back. Although I think it's pretty obvious looking at the story that um, it was not a case of a changeling, that that was just a human child that had been born with medical issues. So you can see where this lore, um, this folklore is very complicated, uh, even within the folkloric material, the belief system. Um... It's not simple or straightforward to get into. Um, we also, of course, have adult cases of changelings. Um, again, there are some stories where people are recovered. Um, there are many where they are not. Um, there's at least one I'm aware of that is uh, supposed to date into the very early 20th century or late 19th century where a man was coming home and saw his neighbor's wife being uh, taken away by a group of the fair folk. Um, he succeeds in rescuing her. Um, he brings her back to his house and then goes to his neighbor's house. Um, uh, his neighbor and his neighbor's family are all mourning that the neighbor's wife, who had just given birth, uh, is believed to have died. 
um, he looks on the bed and he does not see the neighbor's wife. He sees a log of wood. Um, he convinces someone else in the house to help him burn the log of wood. Um, everyone else, of course, thinks he's crazy. Um, but he successfully does so and it breaks the enchantment and then he brings the real wife back home. So the story goes. Now, in another uh, very famous, but again, much more horrific case of Bridget Cleary, um, again, late 19th century, uh, she was a woman who uh, fell ill, uh, most likely from pneumonia, from what I've read. Um, her husband did not believe that she had fallen sick. He believed that she had been replaced with a changeling. Um, she used to sell eggs, and she had been out um, going to her neighbors to sell eggs, uh, and she came back and was ill. Um, he believed that she had been replaced with a fairy, and um, along with several relatives, uh, undertook to cure her and get his real wife back, um, and was forcing her to drink a mixture of herbs, um, throwing urine on her. Obviously, this was not making her any better or returning his real wife, who was not really gone. Um, eventually, uh, they um, or he forced her to um, sit over the fire and her nightgown caught fire and she was very badly burned uh, and she did eventually die from the burns. Uh, and he and several of his relatives stood trial for her murder which he was convicted of. So um, that is at least one case of an adult uh, changeling, accused changeling, uh, which was actually an ill human um, who was murdered by people trying to bring the human back and drive the fairy away. So we can kind of see from all this how complicated changeling lore is. Um, Adding into all that, uh, not only do we have these historic folkloric beliefs that the fairies will take people and sometimes leave behind other fairies or glamoured items, um, and that there are methods to get them back, which clearly can easily go awry, um, dangerously awry with deadly consequences. There was also a movement in the 20th century by academics. Um, you have to kind of understand, when we talk about the academic side of folklore, there's really two different approaches to it. Um, there's the academics who study folklore, and really their only goal is to gather it. Um, they're sort of observers of the folklore who just want to collect the material and make sure that the stories are not lost. But then you also have academics who collect the folklore and study the folklore and seek to find explanations for things. So they're not just looking at what are the stories, they're looking at why. Why are these stories? Why do people believe the things that they believe in these um, traditional communities? So when we look at the changeling material, we have uh, a selection of material that we have because different folklorists have collected it. And then we also have um, some situations where different academ academists, I can't say the word today, different people in academia, we'll go with that, have attempted to explain why certain beliefs exist within traditional communities. And one example of that is in the changeling lore in the 20th century, um, we see a definite push in academia um, through a variety of different articles coming out where people try to explain changeling lore as um, older traditional communities looking for explanations for specific uh, types of uh, human medical conditions, um, particularly autism. Um, that was a big one in the late I think 1980s and 1990s was when we see a lot of articles um, going after that one in particular. Prior to that, it was a more general um, way to explain if a community, um, if a family had a child that fell ill um, or had any sort of 
behavioral or physical disorder come on them um, that you could explain it as, well, they've been taken by the fairies. I think this is problematic in a couple ways. Um, first of all, I am always a little wary whenever we see modern people assuming that people a hundred or two hundred or a thousand years ago were not as aware of or knowledgeable of diseases or disorders or illnesses as we are. They may not have had the name for it, but that doesn't mean they didn't know that it existed. Um, and often when we actually study the different uh, medical texts and you know, equivalent sorts of things, uh, we, we do find that they were pretty aware of things. Um, sometimes they're actually more advanced in certain areas than we are today. Um, so I'm a little skeptical that people would have been totally unaware of um, sort of really the wide array of children's um, behavioral and medical disorders that kind of get blamed by modern academia on uh, changelings. Do I think sometimes it did happen? Yes. Um, I think it's pretty clear when we look at some of the examples that um, desperate people would hit a point where uh, they would have a child that had been ill for quite a while and they would attempt these cures, uh, which would usually result in the death of the child. But I don't think that the entire bulk of changing beliefs and lore was simply a way to explain why a child that was previously perceived as healthy uh, suddenly had some kind of change come over them. Um, and certainly people did understand if a child became ill and developed a fever that something was going on with that. Um, I think there's a reason in the late 19th century that Michael Cleary was convicted of murder, even though it was in a culture that still held a lot of the traditional fairy beliefs. People knew that um, what he had done was not appropriate and that his wife, in fact, was not a changeling, uh, that she was just ill. Um, and that she should have been really cared for by a doctor and not forced to undergo all of these uh, cures, as it were. That's just kind of my viewpoint on it. Um, but you will find a lot of material from the later 20th century talking about changelings as um, basically just ill human children. Human children who had either uh, medical conditions, behavioral conditions, um, autism various things along those lines. Um, and that the, the entire changing belief system was just a way to explain all of that. Like I said, um, I'm a little skeptical. Uh, that's just me. Now, more recently, within the last five years or so, I've seen another sort of switch with this, particularly in the pagan community, although not exclusively, where, um, and I really don't understand this one. Um, some people are sort of seeing changeling in a, a positive light. Um, I've seen parents using changeling as like a term of endearment for their children. Um, I don't know. That one sort of horrifies me a little bit. Um, calling your own child a changeling is basically saying that they're not really your child. And that your child has been kidnapped away by fairies and that, you know, the child you're raising is a random stranger. It's a little strange to me, but it is something I'm seeing. I think it's a misunderstanding of what the entire concept of changelings are. Um, I've also seen something going around um, sort of trying to explain the concept of changelings as if... Um, the changeling themselves is, uh, because it was associated in academia as a way to explain children with autism, that then um, if you are someone who has autism, that um, it's a way to sort of reclaim that, in a sense. Um, 
But I think that's sort of misunderstanding what the academic perspective was. Because it, it wasn't saying that the children themselves actually were changelings. Um, it was saying that the culture that was calling them changelings was using that as an excuse to explain a medical condition or behavioral condition they didn't understand. Um, a changeling is not a human being. They are um, a, a fairy. So to, to sort of call yourself a changeling is to say that you feel that the child that was meant to be with your family, the human child, was taken and that you are a fairy or an inanimate object glamoured with magic that was left behind as sort of a cuckoo to be raised by them to take up their resources and their time and their energy and their love as a distraction while the real human child has been kidnapped away into fairy for whatever uh, nefarious or not purpose. I kind of have a problem with that, I gotta be honest, and you know, I'll have a little little real-time moment here, which I don't usually do in these videos. Um, you know, I have a daughter uh, who has autism, and she's my daughter. She's my flesh and blood. I love her dearly. Um, she is not a fairy. Well, you know. Um, <laughs> she is my child, and I don't think that my real child has been taken away somewhere and kidnapped by fairies and that this other person was left in her place that I'm being forced to raise. I actually think it's a pretty horrific thing for any parent to say that about their own child. Um, I think it's just another way for parents to maybe more acceptably say, I do not believe this is really my child because they have this um, this neuroatypical thing going on. Um, and it really, really bothers me to see people today saying that. Um, she's, she's not a changeling. Um, she is my child. I gave birth to her. I was there. I remember it. Um, and, you know, is she neuroatypical? Yes. Is she totally awesome? Also, yes. Um, does living in a neurotypical world make her life more challenging? Yes. Um, but that doesn't mean that she's uh, not my child and that she was forced on me by fairies who stole my real child. And that's a horrifying narrative that I would never tell my child, who is my child. I'm going to keep emphasizing that. So I didn't mean to sidetrack a little bit here, but that's sort of a modern thing I'm seeing relating to changing folklore. And it does really bother me um, on a personal level. So I, I just felt I really needed to, to say that. Um, I think when we talk about changelings in a modern sense, it's important to remember a changeling is not a human being. A changeling is a fairy. Um, or an inanimate object, glamoured to look like it's alive. But putting that second definition aside, a changeling is a fairy. Um, one of the traditional methods to reveal if your um, child that you thought might not be your real child wasn't actually your child, was a changeling, was to try to catch them doing something they should not be able to do. So we see a variety of stories where you were supposed to leave your infant or toddler in a room alone, but sort of spy on them. And in some cases, the toddler would then get up and fashion bagpipes or, or alien pipes, um, depending on whether we're talking Scottish or Irish lore here, out of reeds and then play them with the skill of a master, because remember, they're ancient fairies. Um, or you were supposed to um, wait and they would start talking to other fairies in the room, um, obviously an infant or toddler should not be able to speak fluently as an adult. Um, or another method we see in stories is you're supposed to get an eggshell and boil water in it. 
And then the changing would leap up and say, oh, you know, I'm a, a thousand years old. I'm the father of seven fairies and the grandfather to, you know, 21. And I have never seen anyone boil water in an eggshell before. Something like that. And then once they've revealed themselves to be a fairy, they would be forced to flee out the window or whatever up the chimney and your real child would be returned. So when we talk about what a changeling is, that is what a changeling is. Um, and when we look at the bulk of the lore, that is what a changeling is. They are um, something that is used by the fair folk in order to steal a human being uh, and buy themselves some time before anyone realizes the human being is gone. Or, as we discussed in many cases, the changeling would sicken and die, and then no one would ever know that the human being had been taken. So, when we're looking at um, changeling lore and what changelings are, that is really where we're at with it. Um, it's a very, very complicated folklore um, we see a wide array of accounts. We see, uh, quite a lot of methods for, um, getting changelings to leave and getting the human babies or children back. Or, um, I know I emphasize babies and children. Again, this does also occur with adults, um, particularly, uh, new mothers and brides, but occasionally also young men. Um, it's hard to know for certain how to unravel all of these threads with the changeling lore. Uh, certainly some aspects of it may relate to human beings uh, misusing belief and practice in order to cause harm to other human beings. Um, it is also possible, of course, for people who genuinely believe that these beings exist, that these things do actually happen or did actually happen that human beings are taken and that changelings are left in their place um, in order to make it easier for the human beings to be taken it's hard in this case to really go to academia um, because with academia you're looking at people writing about this scholars writing about this who don't believe that the fair folk exist um, these are not people writing from a place of belief. These are people writing from a place of disbelief. So then when they're looking for explanations, they are looking for um, effectively atheistic explanations. If the fairies don't really exist, then what is the most logical real world, not otherworldly reason that this could possibly have happened? Um, which is where we get the idea that it was just always an explanation for um, human children who were ill or had behavioral issues. Um, despite the fact that we do see during the same time periods um, folk treatments and folk cures for illnesses and behavioral issues, um, which I think complicates that theory a little bit. When we look into the living cultural tradition that still believes in changelings, obviously they believe in it. They, they don't um, have any question as to why this is done. It's done because the fairies take people and sometimes they leave changelings in their place. So we're left in this sort of ambiguous middle ground of, you know, does it happen um, how often does it happen? Would we know when it happened? Um, certainly you don't want to physically abuse or neglect, particularly an infant or child, because you think they might not really be a human being. You think they might be a fairy. That's horrific. Don't ever do that. Um, but on the other hand, if you truly believe these beings exist, then that is potentially something that could happen, in which case you would have to find another um, far more humane way to figure out um, if they are a changeling, if they're actually a fairy and not a human, and how to get the real human back. Something to think about. Um, but when you look at the bulk of changeling lore, when you look at the stories and the anecdotes, um, even into the modern era, it's just all just something to keep in mind and to think about.
It's a very complicated topic. It's a very convoluted topic. Um, keep in mind that people have believed this strongly enough that they actually have committed murder over it. Um, and it is something that continues as a belief to this day hopefully without any more murder. But it is also something that I think we need to be extremely cautious about twisting in a modern context and making into something that it is not and that it was never intended to be. Changelings are not human beings. Um, they just simply are not. Uh, that is not what they have ever been. That is not the definition of what they are. Um, and although I can see multiple reasons why people sometimes might find some comfort or have some desire to connect to the idea of changelings. Uh, it doesn't change the fact that they are not human um, and that there is not a great deal of logic in personally believing that you might be a changeling. Um, it would just mean that you are a, a very, very ancient fairy trapped in this world and that the real human is trapped in the world of fairy and that really goes against all of the folklore um changelings were not sent here with no memories of what they were um just not how that worked um i know it happens in modern novels but that's not what happens in the folklore and the mm -hmm. anecdotal material so just some things to give some thought to um i know modern fiction has some great storylines um, I've actually read a, a good series of books based on the idea of a changeling who um, finds out she's a changeling, she's a pixie, and then helps get the original human child back and goes on into shenanigans and adventures. But just give some thought to the actual folklore um, and what changelings really are uh, and how that may or may not um, fit into modern beliefs. I guess I'll leave it there today. I know this is another long video. It's a very complicated topic. Um, and I will link to that article that I wrote in the comments. Have a good day.